Well, it is uh, with a great sense of excitement that I'm here along with Chris and with Daryl, and I, you, I hope you've spent many hours with the three of us in the past, but we are here to do something special. Now, I sat down and I was actually, I was counseled. This is the last podcast, the last video of the year, and keep it simple, keep it light, and keep it uh, short. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, the natural topic will be what lessons did we learn in 2020? And we did learn a lot of lessons, and it turned out when I did a search on the internet about lessons learned from 2020, that there are about 100 articles and lists of things that anybody could go read and get a sense of some of the things that happened, and they won't be surprises to you. But then I thought, why give lessons that everybody else is, is, is already doing that? What about the best lessons that came out of the work of our foundation? And I've got, to, I've got to tell you, I can maybe take credit for a little bit of that work, but the real work was done by Chris and Daryl. And so I asked whether on December 30, when other people are winding down and enjoying their life, they would join me and look back at 2020 and figure out what is it that we did in terms of sharing information with investors that represent important lessons for a lifetime, not for the next year, but for a lifetime. And I was hoping we would come up with 10 because I always want to come up with 10 at a minimum. And by golly, it turned out there were at least 10 really genuine, good I even think great because they're good teaching moments, pieces of research that these two gentlemen were responsible for. And that's what we're gonna spend a few minutes here today talking about. So, uh, and, oh, and before I, we get going here, I gotta, I, I've got to issue uh, one major thank you. Actually, there are a whole bunch I'd like to, but I don't want to bore you. A lot of you took the time and, uh, and, and, and sent us a donation in the last month. I was pleasantly surprised when I got up early this morning to see how many PayPal donations were made. I, we really appreciate it. This all helps us in what we've got coming in the next year. And we're going to spend a minute at the end of this uh, discussion talking about some of those things that we are working on to help you. So, We've got 10 of them. They all have, almost all of them have some numbers to go along with the conversation. And Daryl and Chris have been nice enough to put together the documented, the, the, the tables or the graphs that we've used in the past year to discuss these items. Many of you are on a, on a podcast and you can't see this information. We're going to discuss it as simply as we can, but there will be a link to each one of these tables or graphs in the write-up, whether it's YouTube or the write-up uh, for the podcast. So uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I, um, I'm, I'm sorry that this isn't a quick and dirty year-end piece, and I am so glad that we have some of you here to take and spend some what I hope will be valuable time for you, and let's get going. Daryl. You turned out a whole bunch of great work this year. I, I, I counted uh, over 70 tables and graphs and things that you did that, um, and some of those, as you know, we're, we're doing all those distribution tables that we do and the fine tuning tables that we do. But um, I, I, I liked one piece in particular. And in fact, when I saw it, I, tr I was excited because it represented something very similar 
to a, a graph or a, a piece that Callan puts out that shows the returns over the last 20 years of a whole bunch of different asset classes. But you went over the top. Uh, you took our four major asset classes all the way back to 1928. You let us look one year at a time at how those major asset classes, along with the four fund strategy, the balance of all four, how would that have looked? And, and what did you learn when you look back at that, uh, that wonderful, wonderful, uh, I think you call it a, a quilt chart. Well, that was you actually, have it right there. Actually, one of the, one of our uh, listeners called it a quilt chart. I, I don't remember what I called it, but I thought that was an excellent term because that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. So yeah, we spent a lot of time this last year delving into quantitatively understanding uh, the variability of returns. How do they vary over time? How do they vary with respect to each other? And, uh, and while a lot, of, a lot of qualitative understanding was already present in what that means, going through and doing some quantitative work uh, gives us a, a better feel for exactly how those variability things happen or what, what that variability means. So let's bring the quilt chart, the infamous quilt chart up here. And this, as Paul mentioned, this is 92 years worth of data, one year at a time, the four, asset four US asset classes and the four fund portfolio. Um, it's, it's quite a bit of data. <laughs> so one of the things that, that came out of this is that uh, it's it, the returns rankings from one year to the next are very variable. Um, and they don't always fall the way you thought they, you think they should. Uh, 20 times out of the 92 years, the returns for the asset classes fell in the order of their, their quote expected unquote returns. Small cap value, small cap land, large cap value, large cap land or the S&P 500. Uh, so that's 22% of the time out of the 92 years. <laughs> but on the flip side, 15 out of those 92 years, 16% of the time, it's exactly the opposite of what you would have expected. So they're variable and they're unpredictable. If, if you're looking at the video, you can see the blue ones are the ones that are in the order and the, and the red ones are the ones that are in the opposite order. One of the things that comes out of looking at this 92 years of data though, is that 53 of those years, 58% of the time, small cap value did outperform the S&P 500 or, or basically the US market. So while things are variable and the way they expected returns stack up is not predictable, more often than not, the, the the one with the highest expected return outperforms the one with the lowest expected return, which is sort of what you would expect, but, but this kind of quantitates, quantifies it or quantitatively defines it a little bit. If you go and, and if you go and look at periods now of, of, by decades, let's say one decade at a time, um, it, it, things get, get less predictable sort of, but in what, some ways more predictable. Um, only two out of those nine decades do the, do the actual expected return rankings rank out the way you would expect them to. So it's about the same as the 92 years. So the, the rankings are about the same when you look at it by a decade, decade by decade. But now, instead of the small cap value outperforming large cap blend, only 58% of the time, it does it almost two thirds of the time, 67% of the time. So so that's a little bit more. Once you look at a little bit longer uh, time horizon, things get a little more uh, quote unquote predictable, at least based on the past data. If you go and look at 20 year periods, now things are starting to sort of shake out the way you might expect. Three out of the four of those 20 year periods, the rankings were exactly as you would have expected based on, it, on their expected returns for the asset classes. And then the one where it wasn't expected, it's, it's still uh, not very unusual, um, but four out of four of those 20 year periods from 1930 or 1940 rather through 2019, 
uh, the small cap value outperformed the S&P. Every one of those four independent 20 year periods. Um, now, Daryl, so I might just add something here as I, as I look at this 20 years and boy, these, th these results do certainly make the case for patience and, uh, and, and not, it isn't that we don't want you to get what you want when you want it. We just know that people normally don't get what they want when they want it, which is now when it comes to investing. But I'm thinking about all those young people I'm going to be talking with next year. And I look at over the 20 years where bonds and T-bills, government bonds and, 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 and one month, 30 day T-bills guaranteed by the US government in both cases. But when I look at what happens over those 20 year periods, and I think of those, I think it's something like 25% now or more of young people are putting any money in stocks at all. They're keeping it someplace safe like bonds. And I think, God, please take a look at this table and understand what the payoff is for the patience of waiting for these returns to, to, to come to you, even if you only got the S&P 500 or total market index. It wasn't shabby compared to the returns of the, of the right. fixed income. So uh, that to me is a, is a huge lesson for young people, but go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, you're absolutely right. We'll talk about patience next. Um, but one more thing to notice here is if you look at the four fund combo, you, this is the US four fund combo, which is basically 25% of each, well it is 25% of those all four asset classes, small cap value and blend and large cap value and blend equally equally allocated. It sits right in the middle, which is kind of what you would expect every one of those 20 year periods. And its return is not bad. Um, in general, it's, it's anywhere between a percent and a half and two, two percent, uh, or maybe a little more even in some cases than the S and P 500. So that's, I got a way in there too, Daryl. I got a way in because this is a biggie. Okay. There are people who truly believe in terms of equities, the only place to invest for the long term is either in the S and P 500 or the total market index. In fact, the total market index is the first mutual fund to have over a trillion dollars invested in it. I mean, this is really amazing when you think of the confidence. But I, but remember, the S and P 500 and the total market index have almost the same return. So when I look at how the S and P 500 did, and I look at uh, the expectations for the total market index, I would say that they would both do about the same. So here's what I'm seeing that really makes a big difference. I look at the four fund combo and uh, which of course is 25% in the S and P 500. And I see that in one of the uh, four 20 year periods, uh, the return was less than 10%. And in a couple of cases, it was over 15%. And then I look down at the S&P 500 and I see one, two 20 year periods that it, it underperformed uh, the 10% that we normally think about when we think about equities. But in the case of the four fund combo, it underperformed by less than 1%. It compounded at 9.1. But those two decades, those two 20 year periods, the S&P 500 made less it was 6.8 and 6.1. Boy, that is a big, big difference. And of course, right. then I have to ask, can you tell us, either one of you, how much more risk that you take being in the four fund strategy versus the S&P 500? Chris, what would you say? I, we'd have to go back to your tables uh, that Daryl's got, and I'm sure he's got them somewhere nearby. It's a few percent in drawdown risk, right, Daryl? Yeah, added. We, I mean, we, it's, we'll, not, it's not very much. Um, but we you have do, the data later. Yeah. Oh, do you? Okay. Right. At All least right. some of the data um, in terms of standard deviation and drawdowns and things like that. All right. I'll be patient. Sorry. Let's. That's okay. Let's go on. 
Yeah, the um, the uh, lost my thought. Well, okay, my my fault. So, no, no, no. So, well, I guess um, kind of the bottom line here to me was that that things are variable. Um, they're not predictable. Uh, so, what are you going to do? Well, the answer kind of is to just in the in the infamous words of of John Bogle is to stay the course. Okay, because if you look at uh, how things here, so if you look at how things vary over time, going back to this chart here, um, it's kind of hard to figure out what's happening here when you look at this in a longer term scale. So one of the things that that I spent some time this past year doing was looking at uh, how relative performance of one asset class or one portfolio compared to other portfolios. And the perfect, uh, or one of the perfect, or maybe an, a good way of looking at that is called a relative performance chart, or as John Vogel referred to it and popularized it, it's the telltale chart. So this is briefly what a telltale chart is. On the left here, uh, you can't see this on the on a podcast, but basically it's two growth curves of the S&P 500 and the, and the U.S. four fund combo portfolio. And so when you look at these numbers or when you look at these these graphs, these lines on here, it's kind of hard to figure out what the relative performance at any over any one interval is. You know, over the course of these 90 years that the U.S. four fund did much better. Than the, than the S&P 500, but it's hard to tell what's happening in between. So if you take the, the US four fund returns or growth actually, and divide it by the growth of the S&P 500, you get what's called a relative strength or a telltale chart. And that's what's on the right here. You can't see it on the podcast, but, but basically it shows how the growth this, that you ended up with at the end of the 92 years came about over time. And when you look here, you can see there are flat periods and you can see that there are times when things really grew much faster. The U.S. four fund grew much faster than the S&P. There are a few times where it didn't do as well. Um, so when you take and you look at that over time and you again look at the nine decades data, again, you, if you remember back to the quilt chart we had for the decades, you can, you can see how one decade after another, the decades are, are most of the time the U.S. four fund outperforms the S&P 500. Sometimes that ride's not very smooth, though. Um, if you look at the, the 1970 if on the chart on the on the video, if you look at the 1970s, OK, um, even though over the decade, the U.S. four fund had 50 percent higher growth it, over the uh, S&P 500, the first four or five years were not fun. Um, they, they went down quite a bit. Uh, similarly, if you look at the at the decade of the 90s, the S&P 500 uh, outperformed the U.S. four fund, but that outperformance didn't come until the last two years of the 1990s, really, is when it when it fell, when the uh, U.S. four fund fell down a little bit. So it's variable. And by the way, Daryl, if I could just note there, it, it isn't that the four fund strategy lost money in those final years because right. that it did make money, but the S and P 500 just absolutely ran away from the pack. Right. So relatively it did poorly, even though somebody could say, well, I did okay, but right. that's exactly true. That's the difference between a, what the telltale chart is does is it tells you how you performed relative to something else. It doesn't say you lost money or even really that you made money necessarily. It's just that you, you made less or lost less than the other asset that you're comparing yourself to. Uh, one of the things you'll notice on here is there are also periods where there's relatively flat performance where from the beginning of one, one period, it likes, let's pick 1980 here, um, to the end of 2000, uh, those 20 years, 21 years, uh, the U.S. four fund essentially had the same growth over that 20-year period as the S&P 500, which, if you remember your history, is actually kind of amazing because the S&P 500 was the U.S. market, 
was pretty hot during those two decades. Um, so let's let's kind of break this down a little further here. So if we're talking about the US four fund, there are periods of time, 20 years from the mid 40s to the mid 60s, eight years, basically the late 60s to the mid 70s, uh, 17 years from the early to mid 80s to the early 2000s, where your performance was even, but what happened at the end of that period, okay? Let's take an example here in the, in the early 70s, late 60s through the mid to late 70s, that eight year period where you had essentially the same performance as the S&P 500. What happened at the end of that? Well, over the next seven years, you outperformed the S&P 500 by 69%, 7.8% per year, per year. What happened in the next period of time? Well, there were 17 years where it was pretty flat, okay? But starting in about 2001 through about 2006 or so here, it looks like, seven maybe, you outperformed the S&P 500 by almost 60% over that five years. That's almost 10% per year. So what does that mean? To me, what that means is that you have to have patience because there will be times when you won't necessarily lose money. You just may not make as much as the S&P 500. But when, it, when, when the inevitable, and at least in the past, when the inevitable has happened, that things turn around, you make up ground and you, you more than make up ground, you, you pull ahead quite dramatically over, over a few number of years. Most of your returns come in relatively short periods of time, but boy, do they come when they do. And, and, and I might mention, Daryl, that uh, in, in a way, even in the, in the business of investing, there are a lot of neener neeners. And uh, there are people who um, may believe the only place to be is the S&P 500. And when it's been so much better than small cap value has been, then it's easy to see to say, I told you so, I told you so. And that's one of those neener neeners. And then, and people feel like they made the right decision. And so as I look at this chart, it says that I can go for 15 to 20 years of, of neener neeners quite, quite often over a long life where you would just feel like you're out of sync with what you believed was going to happen. And that is certainly a part of successful investing. John Bogle says it, Buffett says it, almost everybody uh, that has been a long-term successful investor will say, get on course the best that you can and stay the course. Or if you are the type, and they don't necessarily say this, but I'll add it to the list. If you're the type that can't stay the course with one strategy, Maybe what you do is you find two or three strategies. You divide your portfolio up into different strategies that have evidence of a lifetime of success. And maybe that diversification of strategies will help you stay the course for the long term. Yeah. Sorry, once again, no, I, no, I, 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 think, <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, I think there are two things that out of that come out of that. One is what Chris always says, and that is that if, 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 if you if you want to do better than the market, you got to be different than the market. Yeah. So yeah. so that's one one thought process. And the other one, what was your what was your second point again, Paul? Uh, you know, at seventy seven, this uh, this is the problem with being seventy seven. I have no idea. He said yeah. he said diversify. He, oh he, yes, he, that's he right. He said place multiple bets. Right. You know. If you, right. If you, yeah, don't put uh, don't put all of your confidence in a single bet. Put it in in multiple yeah. asset classes. Um, Strategy you know, diversification. Yeah, I you know Paul, I listened to uh, today's podcast that you just released this morning, and you said at the end of it, this was the one on um, uh, twelve Vanguard funds for retirees, and at the mm -hmm. end you said investing is not complicated. You can you can learn this stuff. Um, I would add to that investing, you know, the principles of investing aren't complex, but they're unnatural. Mm. Um, it's not, 
it's not something that comes naturally to a human being to learn lessons over decades. We tend to learn lessons over minutes, hours, days. You know, we, we've been evolved to touch the hot thing and learn don't touch the hot thing again. And it's so easy in investing to learn the wrong lesson. You know, you could get in an asset class for two years and have it perform poorly and draw the conclusion that I should never be in that asset class again. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be such a disservice to you over the long haul. And so I, I think these, these charts that Daryl has made are just fantastic at teaching the importance of, of patience and also the value of respecting long-term historical data that isn't reflexive. It's not easy. It's not natural. Right. These are un, it's an unnatural learning process, and that's what makes it hard. Yeah. And you, by yeah. the way, and you live with the worry uh, that if you keep trusting something that's not working out, that it won't work out, and then where will you be? And and uh, I've seen that in in so many people afraid to sell something because they know the minute that they sell it, it's gonna take off. And so they hang on and they hang on. Oftentimes those are individual stocks that in fact never do come back. But when it comes to indexes, at least in the past, they have almost always come back. Yeah, one, of, one last point on this chart and then it'll apply to the, the, the next charts I'm gonna to show too is that this is, this is a relative strength chart that shows if you had in, invested in the, in the very beginning of this at about, I guess it's 1930 here, okay? So an in, in example, in the, in the late 60s to mid to late 70s, there was a period of time there where relative to the S&P 500, your growth did not keep up. However, if you would have started investing in the, in the early 70s, say in 73 or so, over the next 12 years or so, you would have had quite a big, you would have had a much better return than, than after you had broken even if you had invested earlier. I'm not saying this very clear, but uh, clearly, but the, where, the, where the investor who had invested back in, in 1930, he had a set almost 70% gain over the following 70 years, seven years. If you would have invested in 73, instead of waiting until you broke even again at, at 77 before you uh, measured your gain, it would have been significantly more. I don't have the numbers here, but you, this is a log scale. And so in, when you can look at the video and see what, what it looks like, it just depends on where you invest. So moving on now, I guess, this was the, the US four fund portfolio. After the 92 years or 90 years here, I guess, you had uh, 5.7 times as much growth as the S&P 500. If you go now and look at an all U.S. value portfolio where you have U.S. small cap value and U.S. large cap value, 50-50, and you compare it to the S&P 500, the character remains the same. There are periods of, of relative underperformance and dramatic periods of relative outperformance. Um, but overall, at the end of the 90 years, instead of being 5.7 times the uh, growth of the S&P 500, you're up to 9.6, almost 10 times as much growth. This is for lump sum investment on day one. Uh, if you go and look at US small cap value, again, long periods of outperformance or underperformance followed by periods of dramatic outperformance, in some cases as much as 20% per year compared to the S&P 500. You also end up with 24.3 times. So what does all this mean? To me, this means that you have to have patience. Whichever strategy you pick, you have to have patience to let it ride. You've picked this strategy, if it's one of these three or other strategies that are different than the S&P 500, and you picked them because you wanted to get a different return than the S&P 500. So you shouldn't be, <laughs> it's easy to say this, hard to do this. You shouldn't be disappointed necessarily when you don't get the performance that you thought or that the market is getting because you don't want the performance that the market is getting you want something different now, now daryl i've got a question because this uh this leads to a thought about what we could do next year here that would be 
interesting, particularly to young people. Uh, you, this is all lump sum, as you say, which means you put money in on day one, you don't add, you don't take it out. And um, I can what would you think? Coming. Pardon? <laughs> I can feel it coming. <laughs> yeah. What would it be like if we simply dollar cost averaged over 92 years? Uh, I know that that sounds like that's uh, an improbability, but what about the newborn child? 92 years is actually a possibility, but it would be a question, how much more would you have from small cap value compared to the S&P 500 based on dollar cost averaging? I have no idea, but I'm guessing it's more than 24.3 times the S&P 500. Well, I'm, I'm sure Chris has the tools that he could use to, to follow the two funds for life uh, process where and, mm -hmm. and apply it to other portfolios, I suppose, where you where you dollar cost in, in average in over time and then you take it out over time and look at look at a life cycle of 90 years or 92 years or whatever. And uh, okay. and compare that to the S&P 500 having done the same thing or total totally U.S. market or even a three fund type portfolio. US, yeah. uh, US international and, and uh, which I guess is two funds. But. And by the way, Daryl, I was watching Chris's eyes while you were saying that to see whether he was receptive to the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can, <laughs> we, so I, I do, uh, Daryl and I do a little bit of a different kind of analysis because uh, with the focus on two funds for life, uh, it's really, when you, when you have this glide path that's changing the asset allocation over time, yeah. it's important to test it at different start dates. And so yeah. I do a rolling return analysis where most of Daryl's, uh, perhaps all of Daryl's analyses, I think, are uh, uh, like a, se a sequence of returns based on uh, one set of history. But yeah, we could we could do some of those kinds of analysis next year, and I, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be that hard. It'd be interesting. Great. Right. Okay, so let's see what were we going to talk about next. We talked about all of that. Oh yes. Okay. So one of the things that Paul was mentioning here is that this isn't that hard. Okay, you don't need a huge uh, portfolio, you, like the ultimate buy and hold, you can have that. But if you if that's not your style, you don't need that to get outsized returns. One of the things we looked at over the year were simple portfolios, or as Paul calls them, no-nonsense portfolios. Uh, we looked at a suite of, I don't know how many are here, 12 or 13, something like that. And uh, of, of varying from the S&P 500 and total US market to four fund portfolios or US worldwide, all world value, all value worldwide. Um, and we looked at, uh, in this particular time, because we had a, a problem with data availability only going back to 1990, we only looked at the last 30 years. Uh, but when you look at those last 30 years, what you see is that the S&P 500 and the total US market basically returned about 10, 10.2%. And you look at the other portfolios, there's a three fund equity portfolio, which is basically the total US, total international. It's, it excludes the bonds for this analysis. Uh, US with plus 30% of US small cap value, world plus 30% US small cap value, the all US value. Uh, there's a core four portfolio, which is based upon Rick Berry's work. Uh, there's the US four fund, the world four fund, and the all value world. And when you look at those and, and remember that the, the uh, total US market basically returned about 10.2, four of these alternative portfolios re had superior returns over the 30 years by a percent or more um, in a year, percent or two, up to, up to almost 2% more over those 30 years. The, the total value US plus, or total US plus 30% US small cap value had 11.4%. The all value US two fund portfolio had 12.3%. The uh, US four fund, which we've talked about earlier, had 11.8. And then the all value world, which is uh, large and small value US and international, had 11.1%. So there's a, there are four simple portfolios that you can use. And in the past, 
last 30 years have outperformed uh, the total U.S. market. So when you look at how, how things vary, uh, this is going to be a little bit difficult to, for the podcast listeners, but uh, go see the charts. Uh, I'll describe the chart here. We've, we've highlighted for each one of the one fund, two fund, three fund, or one fund, two fund, and four fund portfolios, which one had the, the best and worst returns. And when you look at it, the best returns are in green and the worst returns are in yellow. Um, and this across, was by the, that was by the year. Yeah, by the year across the spectrum of these 13 or how many there are, how many are there? Eight, 11, I guess, portfolios. Um, and when you look at this, what you see is that um, the S&P 500 had, there's a bunch of green and a bunch of yellow, which basically means there were a lot of times when it was the best and there were a lot of times when it was the worst. Um, the U.S. total market, not quite so much. The ride was a little smoother um, and gave you the same return. So, so that's a better sharp ratio probably than the S&P 500. But when you look at the other at the other four portfolios that we had, the U.S. plus 30% U.S. small cap, all value U.S., U.S. four fund, and all value world, the all value U.S. only, that's U.S. small cap and large cap value, it had a pretty rough ride too. It gave you a good return, the best return, in fact, of the ones we looked at over the 30 years, but it had a very, very rough ride. Uh, lots of green and lots of yellow. Um, when you look at the all value world, which also had a good return, a percent or so better than the, than the total US market, it also had kind of a bumpy ride, although most of its bumps were on the upside. But there are two portfolios as you went through that delivered a better return, a percent or more better return than the U.S. market, and neither had the worst return in a given year or the best return in a given year. So its ride was a little smoother, and that's the U.S., total U.S., plus 30% U.S. small cap value, and the U.S. four fund portfolio. So there are two examples of portfolios that have simple portfolios that have smoother rides and deliver superior returns when compared to the US total market and the S&P 500 in the past, particularly specifically the past 30 years. Can I add something, uh, Daryl, yes. here about the last Absolutely. 30 years? Meb Faber, when he spoke, I think it was in Florida, he had a, uh, one of his graphs showed, it could have been a dozen, maybe more strategies over a very long period of time and they were all supposedly legitimate strategies made up of, of common asset classes. And uh, they did in fact have uh, a fairly narrow range at, at the end of time. Sometimes they were at top of the, of the list, sometimes they were at the bottom, but they kept coming back and doing their thing. It is interesting to me to note that these are all legitimate strategies but the range from the top to the bottom, the range from the top to the bottom is about a 5% difference. And uh, that's a big difference. Uh, and the question is, in my mind, is, is that just a, a random event or is this, is this something that an investor should be able to, when I say count on, I mean, the probabilities would be very good that they would get an additional return by exposing themselves to more than just, for example, the total world market, 7.3% is all large, all big companies, basically, mm -hmm. because it's cap weighted, big companies in the US, big companies overseas, as opposed to the uh, the all value worldwide, which is a combination of big out of favor companies and small out of favor companies. The, the difference there is about a 4% difference in return. Yeah. And is that legitimate? Are we, are, are, are we just data mining or, or is this a substantial piece of, of evidence that young people should be aware of? Um. 30 years is not a long period of time. There you go. And so um, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's not data mining. Um, on the other hand, 
there are there are a lot of people who only look make make investment decisions based on a lot less history than this. Yeah. And so um, I I I be, I I, I, sh- I have a feeling there's something there. I, and I and it's quantifiable to the extent that you can look at and and consider the last 30 years representative. Um, the degree to which you do that is the degree to which you can believe the data that you have here. Yeah, um, Chris, what would be you better add? to look? It'd be better to look at more data. And we actually we actually had Chris will talk about this later, but we actually have more data now that we can go back and look at longer histories. Yeah, good. Uh, you know, I think in a lot of respects, uh, what you just walked through, Daryl, with this chart is a uh, it, it's it, it's a sign that we can confirm what the academics have already found. Uh, the you know, Fama and French uh, won the Nobel Prize for identifying size and value as uh, additional factors that had a long history. Uh, presumably a statistically significant history of delivering value, something beyond random. And uh, so what you've shown in this chart is that uh, when we tilt portfolios a little bit towards small and a little bit towards value, whether we do it in the US or we do it in the, you know, in the world market, whether we do it with four funds or two funds, um, it does increase returns, uh, which is what we would expect. Um, and it also provides a level of diversification because those factors perform at different times than the market risk factor, which is, is what you get when you don't tilt. All you get is the market risk. So um, I, I think okay. there's a, a lot of academic evidence that, that uh, putting some part of your portfolio in small and some part of your portfolio in value is going to give you a little added amount of diversification, a little amount of added return. And then it really comes down to behavioral economics and behavioral finance. How much, how confident are you in that bet? How disciplined are you at sticking to it? How willing are you to tolerate the added drawdown or the tracking error you're going to see as a result of it? And those are really, really hard questions to answer. They have to be answered independently, individually. Um, but I, I hope in the work that you've done here and the work that we do at the foundation, we're helping people make an educated decision about it mm-hmm. so that they choose something that's appropriate for them. Yeah, I guess one, one final thing here I would mention is that, for example, would I say that, that the US four fund at 11.8 compared to the total US market at 10.2, would it always deliver a 1.6% performance over 30 year period? No. Would I believe that it would outperform the total market over that period of time? I think I would. It's, 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 it's hard to say how much things vary over time. Sometimes it would be more, sometimes it would be less. That's great. So uh, moving on, uh, also, for these no-nonsense portfolios, we won't talk about them so much here, but uh, on the website, and, and we'll leave it up here for a second or so, and you can look at it on the, on the uh, podcast video, we have uh, different statistics in terms of growth and up and down years and standard deviations and things like that for the four, four, 11 portfolios that we just looked at. So you can go in and you can delve into some of the little more detail there. Uh, Paul, great, great stuff. Thank, thank you, Daryl. I really appreciate all the hard work that that you've done. Uh, I want to spend just a, a, a few a few minutes uh, uh, talking about the ultimate buy and hold strategy. This is a strategy that uh, Rich Buck and I started writing about uh, probably twenty years ago, and uh, it's basically the same discussion today as it was twenty years ago. Uh, and it, what we did was we started with the S&P 500. That was the total portfolio. Then what would happen if you just threw a series of baby steps? And they really are baby steps. What if you made changes? So we showed the impact of adding 10% large cap value U.S. to a 90% instead of 100% the S&P 500. And that that gave a slightly higher return of about uh, 
uh, two tenths of one percent. And then if you added ten percent in small cap blend, uh, that added another two percent. And by the way, your original investment of a hundred thousand, instead of growing to fifteen million, grows to about eighteen million. And then we add ten percent U.S. small cap value, and that adds about three tenths of one percent. And then we add ten percent in REITs, and that uh, then brings it up to another 10% to 11.4%. Remember we started, I guess I didn't tell you at 10.6 with the S&P 500. And then in one fell swoop, we bring in four major international asset classes, large cap blend, small cap blend, large cap value, small cap value. And that increased those extra four asset classes by uh, six tenths of 1%. And then finally, the one last asset class is emerging markets. And uh, over the last uh, 50 years through the end of 2019, and we'll be updating this table here in the next month or so, uh, the $10,000 grows to about 37 million versus 15 million with the S&P 500 only and a very similar volatility factor in terms of standard deviation. Now, there are no new lessons there. There was no reason for me to bring you this table because this is the same story we've been telling for years, except what happens next shows a, a, a new lesson if you want to. And that is, we then took it into portfolio eight where we eliminated all of the, the blends, we eliminated the REITs, and we had an all value portfolio. And in the past, that all value portfolio produced a better return. And now at the end of 50 years, we had to go out 50 years to see that you can have a couple of bad years in relative returns and all of a sudden, instead of being better, Portfolio 8 is, has now have, has a lower return, not by much, not by much. You wouldn't be disappointed, but it didn't get the premium that one would have expected. So talk about the impact of time and the, and the probabilities that, that things won't turn out exactly as you thought does to me suggest that the idea of building a portfolio with many different asset classes, US international, large, small value growth, REITs, emerging markets, there's a, there, there's a, I think a lot of wisdom to doing that rather than maybe narrowing into a few. The evidence probably when we add another decade to these numbers will likely be that the all value portfolio will have done better but we don't know. So I, I think there is a good lesson uh, in, in that. And that now, by the way, brings me, Chris, to you here. And it's this whole topic. You brought it up earlier, this being able to predict more of the past than we could before. And now we're talking about trying to predict the past, not the future. You want to take us into that discussion? Yeah, we uh, so I think one of the big learnings from 2020, and this this kept me and Daryl both busy for at least a month or two, was that we could uh, do a little bit better job extending our analysis of some of the asset classes back to 1970. And uh, the the realization was that there was some publicly available data av available online that. Uh, reported some of the asset classes we didn't have a history for going back to 1970, namely emerging markets, international developed markets. And so uh, working with Daryl, we came up with a way to, instead of substituting, which is what we did in the past uh, for asset classes we didn't have, we, we built some new asset class return histories going back to 1970 to fill in those gaps. And what we would expect um, by doing that is that we'll have a little bit more diversification and um, a little bit more realistic view of how much international assets help or hurt going back to 1970. 
Um, to give you an idea, um, in the past, if we, for example, no longer had a history for international small cap value, we would have, and Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we would have substituted the other international asset classes we had, right? So we would have gone to international value and, uh, and large cap blend. We would have spread it across the assets we had. And so the farther back you went, the less tilted the portfolio was to small and value and emerging markets. And the less international it was, at some point it got to be, um, I think, a little more uh, U.S. Is that correct, Daryl? Or, or did it get more large and blend? We can't hear oh, you right we now. We can't hear you, Daryl. No, you got to be okay, smarter you're than your equipment. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that was that was true in the past. What we did was we tried to maintain the international U.S. split first. Um, with respect to the progression of, of uh, addition of asset classes, but you couldn't always do that. And it became very concentrated in, in some of the sub-asset classes within the individual geographical diversification. So it, it was much less diverse. Yeah. So by leveraging these uh, international returns that we found externally, uh, we were able to create uh, return sequences going back using something we called rhyme and regress. Uh, so uh, first of all, we kind of had this envelope of what international large cap should have done and emerging markets should have done going back to 1970 based on the return data we could get. But then the question is, because that was fairly coarse, well, what happens on a monthly basis? Uh, you know, what are the monthly returns and what are the monthly returns for the sub asset classes that we don't have available to us. And so for that, we did two things. We, we first of all figured out based on the return sequences we had, what would, a, what would a mathematical model be, you know, when U.S. small cap value, large cap blend and, and large cap value are doing this, what has international small cap value done in the past? And you can build a mathematical model that, uh, that will help you predict when, you're, when you don't have an actual return. So we did that, that was the regression. And then the second thing we did was we, we said, well, sometimes the past is gonna look almost exactly like the future. There'll be a time where you can say, well, you know, Large, large was a good return, blend was a good return, value was a small return, small was a small return. This is how I would, you know, I would match that. Um, so I have that same pattern in the past. I can look for a rhyming return in the future. So working with those techniques, uh, Daryl and I, uh, we, we built a history that goes back to 1970 and fills in the asset class gaps with what we think is more representative data. Um, it has, uh, it preserves more of the premiums for so size and value internationally, going back to that point in time. It still respects these envelopes of returns that were available to us publicly. And uh, we're gonna be using that in, uh, I used it already in the AAII presentation I did this year, but we'll be using it uh, in 2021 and going forward to hopefully provide a more realistic view of what the history would have been, even though you can't get asset class histories for all of those years, but what the history would have been, um, which is all we can ever do with a back test, right? Um, right. So, so that we, we think it's going to help. Um, Daryl, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, a couple of things. I think the the uh, I think the the point of the ultimate buy and hold tables, for example, isn't to say this is what you would have gotten had you been able to do this. It's to show you how add addition of asset classes can help improve performance, reduce volatility, uh, and those kinds of things. Yep. Um, the other thing that I would point out is that when we add these new new returns into the mix and we generate the updated tables this next year. They will be different, a lot different than what you've seen in the past. And I think that what that shows is I think it's more representative of the kinds of, of returns you, you would expect to see for the different asset classes in the mix that we have for the, for the four fund portfolio, for the ultimate buy and hold, and for the other portfolios. So we use it to, to increase our history uh, or, or return sequence data. 
And it, people shouldn't get too hung up on the fact that they are, uh, are different. Um, none of these will ever be perfect. Um, even the academics change the return sequences periodically. They go back and they, you know, they update their understanding of what the S and P 500 holdings would have been in a year where they were predicting what it was because the S and P 500 didn't exist. Um, you know, there's assumptions in there about expense ratios. You know, we're we're trying to come up with an indicative set of data that helps guide people and set reasonable expectations based on the best understanding of the past that we have but it's not a perfect understanding of the past. And it's certainly not a perfect predictor of the future. It's, uh, it's just suggestive. Um, right. So I, I think it's an improvement. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how it played out, uh, when you used your historical data for the AAI uh, presentation and some of it you just showed, it said that the uh, US four fund solution would have outperformed the international four fund solution. Right. And when I extend back the data using this rhyme and regress process, it flips that around a little bit. Yes. It says that the international four fund solution would have done a little bit better. I think that's all within the uncertainty of the process. Right. It, you know, there's, there's that much uncertainty in the process. Yeah. Exactly. Can I just uh, throw one thing in the that, that I, I was happy to see that you guys had done this. Um, our results back in the early 70s, uh, when you think in terms of, of uh, global diversification, uh, really didn't represent what happened in the 70s because our results were heavily impacted by US returns. And uh, as, as we know, and lots of people know in the 70s was really uh, uh, super, the superior returns came out of the international market, but we weren't reflecting that. And of course, that's one of the reasons we like having the, those asset classes together is that you do have periods, whether it's because of currency changes or because of economic factors, whichever it might be, uh, can, can, uh, uh, can make the diversification better. In fact, I think that's Part of what you want to talk about as well, Chris, is this uh, this question about international diversification versus just depending on the U.S. Yeah, I I think that uh, for many people, this is another behavioral finance question. It's you know what are you comfortable with, but the academics say you should you should reflect the market capitalization of the worldwide markets, which would have you at approximately 50% in the U S and, and not have more concentrated risk than that, because you're not going to be rewarded for it. There's always idiosyncratic risk with any concentration. And if you chose, for example, to be a hundred percent in the U S if God forbid something catastrophic were to happen to the U.S. equities markets, you're 100% exposed to that. Uh, if instead you have broad diversification, then you're protected. And when you, we, we sometimes think of these things as three asset classes, emerging markets, U.S. market, international markets, right? Well, the international market is what, 50 countries? It's, <laughs> it's, it's huge. It's, it's very sliced up, right? So when you add that international diversification, you're really spreading out that Id idiosyncratic risk. And I think um, it behooves most people probably to push the comfort zone a little bit, a little bit more in the direction of being internationally diversified, because uh, over the long haul, it shouldn't hurt your returns and it should help your uh, smooth out the ride and protect you. It's a, it's a form of protection. So another, another topic, Chris, that uh, lesson we learned uh, came late in the year, actually, I think, and that is uh, around the uh, impact of, of using some of, with your two funds for life strategy, uh, looking at using the strategy later in life. You, you want to share some of that, even though it's, it's, you're probably going to go into it next year again, but hit us with it now, if you would. Yeah, when I did the AAII presentation in October, one of the things that I ran was a, a series of retirement scenarios using two funds for life. And 
starting at age 60, if you use the two funds for life with the 1.5 times age multiplier, well, at age 60, 1.5 times age is 90. You've only got 10% in your second fund, and it's ramping down to zero by the time you're age 66-ish, 66 and two-thirds. Uh, so my expectation was, well, this isn't going to make much of a difference at all. And I was really surprised because if you were 100% in the target date fund, you had a small chance of of running out of money with a 4% fixed withdrawal rate starting at age 65 and being retired for, I think it was 30, 30, 35 years. Um, I'd have to go back and check. So just adding that little sliver into small cap value, going from 10% down to 0% over those, those years, 60 to 66 and two thirds. So six, almost seven years. Uh, you ended up with a 3% higher median real and balance. You ended up with a 100% 40-year survival rate instead of 98%. So, you know, whether you're retired for 40 years or not, let's hope you are, but maybe for some people that's academic. You also ended up with 0.3% higher safe withdrawal rate. Now, if you think of 4% as a baseline safe withdrawal rate, 0.3% is almost a 10% pay raise in retirement, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so just for that little sliver, you ended up with a better outcome um, and you end up with the same or smaller drawdowns. And so I, I think it helped me validate the idea that, uh, you know, even if all you're willing to do is go from, uh, you know, where you are to a little bit of an appreciation of the value of more equities versus fixed income, or a little bit of a tilt to small in value versus no tilt to small in value. It's likely to help you out. And, and I think that for people listening to us who are trying to find their way, uh, it, it, I, I think that's really sound advice. Try a little bit, right? Try a little bit and stick with it over the long haul. And I, I think it's very, very likely it's gonna help. That's great. Well, I'm, I am just gonna focus uh, uh, quickly on uh, what I learned this year in the process of writing the book with Rich Buck. Uh, and it really, really was in a way surprising to me uh, that when we set out to, to find uh, in our book, by the way, if you don't know the title, it's We're Talking Millions, uh, 12 Simple Ways. Oh, there it is. 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. That's wonderful. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, and oh, I, I really, I hope that uh, if you've got somebody in your life that uh, you think would be uh, helped by this book, read, have them read the reviews of the book because I've been blown away. I do recognize some of the names and I'm not, I'm not surprised they were kind enough to write a nice review, but I don't know most of the names and the reviews are, have really been, been good. But here is the, the interesting aspect of this book. There is nothing new in this book. There's nothing, when I say there's nothing, well, take that back. The last half of the book is about Chris's two funds for life. And, uh, but, but we've been writing about that now for what, about two years? Would it mm -hmm. be Chris? Yeah. yeah. So, so in essence, what it is, it's a book about what we would consider to be common sense investing. And I ask, why has it gotten the kudos that it has? And I, I think it's because people don't understand the impact of a lifetime of additional rates of return. So when we say 12 ways to, to increase your portfolio value by a million dollars, you can imagine the kinds of disbelief that come back from that kind of a comment. You mean, I should expect to have $12 million? Well, actually, it's more than 12 million because the idea is each of these steps is a choice between doing something 
one thing or another. And just that difference between one thing or another can be a million dollars. I'll just give you one example. The difference between stocks versus bonds. If you made a decision as an investor, and a lot of people do, to put your money someplace safe, versus being in the stock market. Forget about small cap value, just the S&P 500. That difference, when you look at 10% compound rate of return, who knows, but that's the last 92 years, versus 5%, which is the last 92 years in, in government bonds, that difference of, of, of 5% is actually, if you invested $6,000 a year for 40 years and you lived off of it and, and then you left it, that difference would be a $10 million difference in what you spent and what you left. And that is, uh, I think, a, a message that just simply comes as a surprise to people that those simple decisions, not stocks versus bonds, it should be an easy one for young people, but it isn't. And hopefully this book will make it that. And that is true of, of all of the rest of the information in the book. All common sense. But we have to realize, and I have to, by the way, I have this with my diet that I've been on since the fifth grade. Every time I sit down to have a meal, there it is. The carb or what? what the, should I be doing the vegetables or... If I am, am I doing greens or am I doing those? Oh, look at those potatoes. See, I mean, this is the reality. We all face these forks in the road. We all know to exercise or not to exercise has implications. Well, those same implications are, are real inside of your portfolio. And all we're trying to get people to do is to make better decisions. And if we get to get all the decisions, all the major decisions, done right. It's a life changer. And I think people are seeing that uh, in, in the book. Now, I did have some other thing. Now, one more thing I was going to cover, but you know, they're going to yell at us. Asia's going to yell at us that we talked on and on and on, and nobody wants to watch us talk on and on and on. I know what I'd like to hear from you both very quickly. What do you got planned for next year? I mean, here <laughs> for the foundation, <laughs> what do you got planned? Chris, what Hello. you got? Uh, let's see. I've got uh, the updated best in class uh, ETFs. Those are going to come out in January. And uh, I'm really excited that we now have enough history to give the Avantis funds a good look. And I'm excited that the Avantis funds are available at M1 Finance. They weren't a month ago or two months ago. So that, that's, they're looking pretty good. I would expect they're going to, you're going to see some of those in our recommendations. Um, the other thing is uh, we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing some stuff around uh, two funds for life 2.0. I've got some interesting ideas about ways to extend the two fund for life strategy into retirement using a kind of a fine tuning approach along the lines of what you do using the ultimate buy and hold where you pick your, your level of uh, equity and fixed income. Uh, the difference here would be you're, you're kind of picking a floor for your second fund. So instead of going all the way to zero on the second fund, I'm doing some analysis around what happens if you say you go down to 10% in your second fund and hold it at 10%. And uh, there's some also, also some work around simplifying with uh, the, uh, the rebalancing and the withdrawal years. So I think there's some cool stuff coming there. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm also working on my book and uh, I'm starting to get a, especially with this two fund for life 2.0 idea, I'm getting a really clear idea of what that should be. So hopefully the book, uh, gets finished, the writing finishes in Q1. And uh, then, you know, the rest of the year is turning the crank to get it out. But yeah, yeah it'll, I think a 21. Working, a runs. working title? Um, just working title probably be two funds for life, uh, a quest for simple, prudent, long-lived investing strategies. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. And thank you for all you do for uh, 
all the folks who are following the work at the foundation, Chris. It's very valuable. And Daryl, thank you as well. It's, it's, uh, it's all so helpful. And it, none of it is stuff I could do on my own. And you guys are, are not only smart, but you're great fun to work with. What do you got on your list for next year? Well, after the first of the year, when, when we have access to the data, we'll be updating the uh, ultimate buy and hold and the associated um, tables and portfolios with that, uh, not for the returns in 2020, but also rolling in the Ryman regress returns from Chris. So we'll have a whole brand new set of returns, particularly in the early years, plus the addition of the 2020 returns for the year. Um, I've also got on the, on the table that I've always wanted to spend some time looking at retirement withdrawal strategies and survival rates and how does asset allocation and time horizon uh, play into that. So we'll be looking at that a little bit. And then uh, I also have done a little, a little study on if, if you want to consider nominal returns and nominal uh, values, what, what should you use for an inflation rate. And so I've done a little study on the last 90 some odd years, 95 years of inflation. And, and how does that play out over various time horizons in terms of, of rates for long-term planning uh, of your uh, inflation rates? Terrific, that's great. And uh, I have a couple of uh, projects. One is to help more people learn about our We're Talking Millions book uh, I'm going to uh, start teaching high school and uh, college classes. I'm going to try to hold myself to no more than one a week, but um, I, I already have one opportunity where I'll be able to speak not only to the students, but their parents at the same time, which is very exciting to me. Uh, we have an audio book coming uh, this next year. I really can't take credit for it because uh, Don McDonald is uh, in the following days, the, the final days of, of having that ready. I want to do a, a, a series of short videos, probably five minutes I, or five to eight minutes on, the, I would guess, 15 to 20 important decisions. And, uh, and it would be aimed at first time investors. So we're going to try to, you can tell when you listen to what what Daryl and Chris are working on, what I'm working on, our focus is all ages, all stages of investing from the very first day that you start uh, till you get in, into retirement and then in, into what you leave behind uh, for others. Those are all uh, concerns uh, that we have. And, and I just got to say on behalf of the three of us, including the rest of the team, uh, Margie and, and Asia and Renee and Jan and, and uh, Rich Buck and, 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 and all the rest of the folks out there that are, are helping us get our message out. Thank you very much. I do wish you all a very happy new year. It's, it's good. I just know it's going to be a better year for, uh, uh our country and, uh, and we want to be there to help you with that important financial part of it. So you test us, you give us some good work to do, and we'll do our best to get it done. So thanks. And, and, and again, for the people that refer others to our work, for the people who, who have donated to the organization, to the people who have donated time to the organization, there are so many people we owe our existence to, but to all of you and our spouses, we all have spouses that uh, their <laughs> lives are compromised because of all this work we do, thanks to them as well. So we will uh, see you soon. I'm sorry this wasn't one of those quick and dirty end of the year presentations, but my hope is it gave you something solid to, to, to kind of build the next year's worth of information and make you a better investor. Thank you. Thanks, guys.